four states that were absolutely essential uh, for the new government un under the Constitution of the United States to be sort of viable. Uh, those four states are Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, Virginia, and New York. And we'll be talking about each of these uh, four states. Uh, Pennsylvania, fairly quickly, uh, and perhaps with a bit of political chicanery. In Massachusetts, the Federalists were a little more careful. On January 17, 1788, Benjamin Lincoln wrote to his good friend George Washington uh, that uh, no one knew exactly how things were going to go in Massachusetts, uh, but that the people who supported the con uh, Constitution knew that they needed to operate with moderation, candor, and fairness. Moderation, candor, and fairness. They did some political chicanery too, but they were, it was a much more open process. It was a much more careful process. It was a much more pro, um, sort of protracted process in Massachusetts. Um, on October 25th, 1787, the Massachusetts State Legislature had uh, issued this call um, for the elections for the state uh, ratific ratifying convention, which would be held in town meetings. Um, the reasons by this moderation, this candor and fairness um, was so sort of important in Massachusetts really is connected to some of the history of Massachusetts in relationship to uh, democracy, uh, popular government, ideas of popular sovereignty. Uh, and <laughs> three things uh, are relevant, uh, relevant here. Uh, Shays' Rebellion, uh, the legacy of town meetings, and the legacy of writing the state constitution in Ma Massachusetts. So the first thing, uh, Shays' Rebellion. Okay, so that letter that Lincoln wrote is in January uh, 1788. In January 1787, there had been this very large uh, uprising in Western Massachusetts, where farmers and others who had been oppressed by heavy taxes, by a very strong state government, uh, uh, where their where farmers were losing their homes and their uh, and their land uh, uh, as a result of legal processes, and they rose up in the spirit, in the spirit of the American Revolution, in the spirit of 1776, uh, under a number of different leaders, including Daniel Shays, whose name has been uh, associated with that. The state of Massachusetts raised its militia in the eastern part of the state, marched out into the western part of the state, and suppressed that rebellion. One of the concerns, one of the reasons that's often given for uh, the necess necessity of writing the U.S. Constitution is the Shays' Rebellion. But the Shays' Rebellion, you know, was something that was ever present in the minds of the politicians in Massachusetts. And they were afraid uh, of unleashing these kinds of forces again. Moderation, candor, and fairness would be a way of sidestepping it. Because many people in Massachusetts, especially in Western Massachusetts, or that part of Massachusetts which is now called the state of Maine, because Maine until 1820 was a part of Massachusetts, it was one state, uh, many of these people feared a powerful, strong government in Boston or nationally. So having a kind of moderate, you know, open, can, you know, with candor and fair process would be a way of sort of reaching out to those people. While simultaneously many of the conservatives in the state, uh, many of the people in and around the Boston uh, area felt that it was important to make sure that a strong national government would be put in place to help avoid things like Shays' Rebellion. So see the Shays' Rebellion is really in, 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 in these people's minds. Um, the um, uh, second element is town meetings. Reaching back to the 17th century, Massachusetts had a tradition of an inclusive local government where people, mainly property holders, 
uh, main, and only men, right, an adult men, uh, would get together and they would discuss issues. That occurred in the 17th century and that occurred throughout the 18th century. That tradition of town meetings was extremely important in terms of having kind of open debates about issues. So, you know, that moderation, candor, and fairness was speaking to those town meetings. And the third, the third sort of background element here uh, is um, the process of writing the Massachusetts State Constitution. In 1776 and 1777, uh, 1778, when the various states were writing their constitutions, no one knew quite how to do it. In mo many states, the state legislatures wrote the constitutions, and that was OK. It was some, raised some issues. Um, but when the state legislature in Massachusetts had written a constitution and then submitted it to the towns, and the town meetings were held throughout the state, people in the town meeting says, wait a second, this isn't any good. We can't have state legislatures writing constitutions because those bodies that have the power to create have the power to destroy. And what's to prevent a state legislature from just changing the constitution anytime they want? We need special representations of the, uh, of the people. We need conventions. And this is where we get the idea of conventions from this process here. Uh, and so uh, Massachusetts held a convention put it before the towns and through a kind of convoluted process in 1780 had created its own state constitution. This also meant that in those town meetings, in those town meetings, people, men, adult, property owning men, were used to debating and discussing pretty, you know, high sounding ideas about the nature of government. You just can't ram, you know, ram this constitution down these people's throats, especially because the state legislature in October had decided to put uh, the election of the ratification, uh, the constitutional uh, delegates in the hands of the town meetings. One of the reasons why Massachusetts has this huge convention, 364 members attend, is because there are so many towns. And, uh, Representation in the towns was fairly broad. Um, uh, the towns of 150 people could send a delegate, 150 voters, I should say, which would be more than 150 people, would be about 600 people, you know, if you, children, women. But a town of about 600 peop people could send a delegate to the legislature, and now these towns were being asked to send representatives to the state convention. And to ensure that there'd be fair representation, um, to ensure that there'd be uh, uh, fair representation, uh, the state of Massachusetts offered to pay the delegates uh, to the convention. Um, this process of these town meetings lasts from November 19th, I believe, until January 7th. This is like different towns holding meetings at different times. Sometimes the towns would get together and they would sort of like in a couple of hours decide, hey, we hate the Constitution. Oh, we love the Constitution. And when Obama, they'd pick delegates. Sometimes they debated it sort of, you know, sort of section by section for days. Um, sometimes they wrote instructions. We want our representative to accept the Constitution. We want our representative to reject the Constitution or we want our representative to accept the Constitution with some amendments. And they'd specify amendments. And sometimes they didn't give instructions. So when Lincoln is writing, uh, when Benjamin Lincoln is writing Washington in January 17, after the convention had already opened up, the convention opens up on January 9th, 1788, uh, when, uh, when, when Lincoln, no one knows what, what's going to happen. In all likelihood, if they had shown up on January 9th and they said, let's have a vote today, the Constitution probably would have been rejected. If it had been up or down, but the Federalists were too shrewd. Yes, they were going to be moderate. Yes, they were going to have candor. Yes, they were going to at least look fair. But they knew that they had to sort of um, make sure that this process dragged out 
and that everyone would have their say, and in particular that they would have their say. Uh, and so they agreed, uh, got the convention to agree, to extend a debate, paragraph by paragraph, article by article, section by section. They would read a section, and then they would debate it, sometimes in a couple of hours, sometime, sometimes in a couple of days. But they did not have a vote after each article. They were going to vote afterwards. And that's, in, again, put, put it off because then it's, then you have to take the whole package or not. Do you see the kind of, kind of logic? If you said, OK, let's talk about Article 1, Section 1. Do you like it or not? Let's, do you support it or not? Then the, the whole thing would come apart on, on them. In these debates, in these debates, the Federalists had all the cards. They had thought about what they were doing more precisely. Uh, they had the most articulate speakers, uh, orators like Fisher Ames, one of the most uh, famous orators of the age, uh, especially uh, later on in Congress in the 1790s. And he'd get up and he'd argue and he'd, he'd be, you know, go on and on. And a lot of the anti-federalists were country bumpkins. They couldn't really articulate fully their ideas. Uh, and they'd get up, you know, well, you know, I, 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 don't, I, I don't like this. <laughs> I'm not sure why. <laughs> I don't think it's fair. You know, it's just, and, and you could see, and then, you know, Ames would come up, uh, let me make, you know, three points <laughs> and about, about this. And boom, boom, boom. Because, uh, you know, Ames had gone to Harvard. And many uh, had been trained in oratory, oratorical skills. And that made a, 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 huge, a, a huge difference. And so the debates went on. Uh, and many of the guys, uh, many of the uh, anti-federalists were not like one unit. They weren't a party. They weren't organized. Some said, well, you know, I pretty much like m a lot of the Constitution, but I'd like some amendments. But which amendments they disagreed about. So it wasn't like they, were, they sat around and had meetings and decided what they were going to do. They were reacting to Federalists who did have meetings and were thinking about what, what they were going to do. And so the debate went on paragraph by paragraph. By the end of January, they had moved on to a debate over the whole thing. The process was going on and on. But the thing that made the biggest difference, the thing that made the biggest difference in Massachusetts were two men, Fam famous, famous men, men you've heard about, Samuel Adams and John Hancock. Samuel Adams had, before the convention, said that he was against the Constitution. Once the convention started, he said, look, I'm not going to participate too much in the debates. I'm just going to listen. John Hancock, extremely popular governor, had been elected after Shays Rebellion, had provided tax relief uh, for many of those farmers, uh, and um, probably was leaning against the Constitution, but did not make his position uh, clear, was elected president of the convention, the state convention, but then didn't show up. He had gout. He was this. He had that. Political excuses. Um, he finally shows up on January 30th. And then on January 31st, stands up and makes a motion, makes a motion to support the Constitution with, and this is a key word, proposed amendments. Not conditionally, but proposed amendments that would, uh, in particular, focus in on a Bill of Rights. Uh, and then Samuel Adams stands up and, and seconds the motion. You know, this changes everything. Quickly, a committee uh, is organized. They write a series of proposed amendments. Uh, those amendments are, are, are shown to the rest of the convention. Uh, probably Hancock had made this move because he had gotten promises and assurances of support in the next gubernatorial election. Um, well, whatever his rationale, whatever his reasonings, that really turned the debate around. That turned the situation around. And ultimately, on February 16th, 1787, Massachusetts really, probably Next to Virginia, the second most crucial state uh, in, to form the United States, ratifies the convention 
uh, uh, ratifies the Constitution with proposed amendments. Uh, and that was enough uh, to bring the vote. Uh, and even, even so, the vote was relatively close. 187 for, 168 against. Right, 10 votes going the other way would have made all the difference in the world. I made it short and sweet. Thank you. Freedom 101 is made possible by generous support from the University of Oklahoma Alumni Association. Freedom 101 is a program of the Institute for the American Constitutional Heritage at the University of Oklahoma. For more videos and podcasts, visit freedom.ou.edu.